<laughs> well, hey guys, I thought about doing a uh, silent intro. Back my mug says sunscreen and subscribe. A viewer sent this to me a while ago. Anyways, hello. In today's video, I'm gonna do a mishmash Q&A. You guys really seem to enjoy these videos where I just answer a handful of commonly asked questions about skincare. Um, Y'all ask a lot of good questions in the comments and then many of you follow me on Instagram and I get a lot of questions there too. Okay, question number one, can I use azelaic acid and benzoyl peroxide together? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, the combination together is actually better in terms of acne control than either ingredient on its own. Azelaic acid, if you're not familiar, it's a great ingredient for acne in that it helps to cut down on plugging up of the pores, but it's also antibacterial, so it can control that little bacterium, cutie bacterium acne that leads to acne. And it's an advantage of azelaic acid in contrast to topical antibiotics like clindamycin or erythromycin. That little bacteria cannot become uh, resistant to azelaic acid. So it's something you can use indefinitely, safely, and it's safe to use in pregnancy. Now, when used in conjunction with benzoyl peroxide, that combination, first of all, they don't cancel each other out. Benzoyl peroxide doesn't compromise the efficacy of azelaic acid. The, the combination of the two is really effective for cutting down the inflammatory lesions of acne, those red painful bumps, as well as the non-inflammatory lesions of acne, which are like whiteheads and blackheads. Benzoyl peroxide, as a side note, is um, anti-inflammatory and it helps target existing breakouts and prevent breakouts in the future. And it's also antibacterial, so it'll target that little bug, P uh, Q bacterium acne, so that leads to acne. But like azelaic acid, that bacteria does not develop resistance to benzoyl peroxide. So this combination could be used long-term indefinitely safely in that it doesn't put you at risk for antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance to topical antibiotics uh, has, has grown quite a bit. In 1978, uh, cutie bacterium acne's resistance to topical antibiotics is about 20%, and that grew to 62% in 1996. So it's definitely something that we are mindful of when we're prescribing topical treatments for acne. And one way to cut down on the risk of resistance if you are using a topical antibiotic to treat your acne, whether that be clindamycin or erythromycin, is to use it in conjunction with benzoyl peroxide. That will reduce the risk, actually, that the bacteria uh, becomes resistant to the antibiotic because they cannot become resistant to benzoyl peroxide. Azelaic acid, though, as a side note, you can use it safely with any active ingredient. You can use it in conjunction with retinoids like tretinoin. In fact, that combination is superior to either alone. And you can use it in combination with any other topical prescription acne medication you may be using, or you can use it in combination with other active ingredients you may be using in your skincare routine. It would pair nicely with niacinamide, which can help calm down redness and help with oily, oiliness, uh, as well as address hyperpigmentation. And azelaic acid plus niacinamide, those are both ingredients that not only are good for oily acne prone skin, but help with hyperpigmentation and melasma. So it's a good combination. All right, number two, I was prescribed Eucrisa and it stings. Any tips? Yes. If you're not familiar, Eucrisa is Chrysoboral. Um, Eucrisa is just the you know brand name of it. And it is a treatment for eczema. It's especially helpful for treating the itch with when it comes to eczema. It's superior to ointment alone. Unfortunately, it stings, as you mentioned. And a way to minimize the stinging is to chill it in the refrigerator first. So I suggest doing that. But yeah, that is actually a limitation of Eucrisa is that it stings so much that a lot of patients simply do not, do not, you know, can't tolerate it. With Eucrisa, the way to use it is, uh, you can use it twice a day, but when you bathe in the evening, as soon as you get out of the shower or bath, apply it to the skin while the skin is still damp, and of course, pre-chill it. This will enhance penetration, and then chilling it reduces the burning and stinging sensation. Allow it to absorb, maybe give it you know 10 minutes, and then apply moisturizer on over it. That combination can really be helpful for eczema. Eucrisa treats the itch and it treats the inflammation in the skin. And so that allows the skin barrier to recover. If a patient is itchy, they're going to scratch. Even if they try not to, they're going to scratch, especially in their sleep when they're not aware of it. That disrupts their sleep, leads to more itch. 
So Euchrysa, um, it targets a certain arm of the in inflammatory cascade in the skin of eczema, and it can calm that down and allow for healing. But if it burns and stings, well, then it's going to end up irritating the skin and can actually aggravate the eczema. So not everybody is not everybody does well with with Euchrysa. I have really oily skin. Is sunscreen enough, or do I need another moisturizer? Sunscreen is enough. Sunscreen is a moisturizer. If you're using a mineral sunscreen, zinc actually can reduce transepidermal water loss out of the skin. But most sunscreens have either silicones like dimethicone, which reduce water loss out of the skin. They have uh, emollients and things that soften skin cell edges, help with hydration. Many of them have humectants. So sunscreens are moisturizing, but some people find that they're not moisturizing enough, in which case then you may need to use an additional moisturizer. Um, so moisturizer, if you are going to use another moisturizer in addition to sunscreen, make sure you put it on first and allow it to absorb fully before putting sunscreen on over it. Sunscreen should always be the last step in your skincare routine in the morning. Now, um, some moisturizers, they will, when you put them on and then you put sunscreen on over, they will cause the sunscreen to pill up, in which case it's not effective. It's, if the sunscreen is pilling up, um, you know, those little balls that roll up off the surface of the skin, well then it's not, it's not protecting you properly. So you, this is a bit of a trial and error. In the description box, I'm going to link my video on how to minimize, how to reduce pilling. <laughs> um, so I have some tips and, and tricks in that video and, you know, kind of things to look out for that may be butting heads and leading to pilling as far as ingredients in your skincare products. But long answer, long answer to say, yes, sunscreen alone can certainly be enough. In fact, I have another video talking about using sunscreen at nighttime as your PM moisturizer. I mean, if you have a moisturizing sunscreen that is more than enough for you to use as a moisturizer, then go ahead and use it at nighttime. There's no risk or issue with that. Some people view it as excessive, but for people trying to pare down the number of products that they use, especially those of you who deal with sensitivity and irritation easily, if you have a sunscreen that you're tolerating well and you're just very sensitive to products, then paring it down to, to just that and using it at nighttime as your stand-in moisturizer, it's, it's an option. And then you wake up in the morning, you at least have some active sunscreen on your skin at baseline. So when you put your first sunscreen layer on of the day, you're kind of ahead of the curve. Um, so yeah, <laughs> sunscreen alone is enough of a moisturizer. Speaking of sunscreen, I get this question a lot. Uh, it's winter time, can I use SPF 15? Is that enough? It is enough uh, if applied to the sun exposed surfaces in a sufficient quantity, which we know from studies that most people under apply. It's kind of difficult to get enough sunscreen on to achieve, to achieve that SPF. But you know, if you, if you are careful, you take your time. And I always tell people to apply one layer, allow it to absorb and then apply another layer to make sure you're not, you, you get, A, you get more sunscreen on that way and B, it minimizes any skip areas. You know, Texas, it's sunny all year round and the sun is very intense here. So that is not a recommendation I would give to people here. I would say SPF 30 at least, but I know a lot of you guys live in parts of the world where there's barely any sunlight in the winter time. And you know, in which case SPF 15 is likely more than enough, provided that you apply it at a sufficient quantity. You only need to be wearing sunscreen during sunlight hours. When the sun is shining, then you need to wear sunscreen. Last but not least, can you recommend an alpha hydroxy acid for sensitive skin? Okay, people who have sensitive skin, you know, it's kind of a nebulous term, but it frequently is something that people self-identify with if they have symptoms of stinging, maybe redness, itch, burning, when things come in contact with the skin. And alpha hydroxy acids are a common reason for burning and stinging, regardless of if you self-identify as having sensitive skin. Alpha hydroxy acids though are very helpful ingredients in a skincare routine because they help uh, soften and um, exfoliate dry, built up dead cells on the surface of the skin, ultimately allowing for better production of natural moisturizing factors in the skin barrier. Um, so to answer your question, if you are interested in incorporating an alpha hydroxy acid into your routine, I would suggest Mandelic. Alpha hydroxy acids, they're a family of ingredients. It's not just one. They include glycolic, lactic, and Mandelic. And Mandelic is much larger 
and it's very, very gentle. Um, Neostrata makes a mandelic acid product that also has polyhydroxy acid in it, gluconolactone, and both of these ingredients, they very, very gently exfoliate the top dead layer, allowing for better health of the moisture bearer, if you will. And they can improve skin elasticity, and they're typically very well tolerated in those with sensitive skin. There's another mandelic acid product that's very good by um, Wish Trend. I'll link that down below because it's a lot more affordable than the Neostrata one. But incorporating mandelic acid into your routine, it can offer a lot of uh, advantages, smoothing out the surface of the skin, especially for people who have more mature skin. So the shedding of those keratinocytes is a bit slower. And as a result, your skin texture is rougher. And it just doesn't look as radiant, as glowy. Incorporating a hydroxy acid into your routine can help smooth that out and ultimately improve the health of the moisture barrier, allow more even penetration of other ingredients. So it's beneficial. And if you deal with um, hyperpigmentation, it can accelerate the clearance of the hyperpigmentation that's up in the epidermis, which um, you know, can even out skin tone. So it's definitely advantageous, but the, for those with sensitive skin, the other um, alpha hydroxy acids often burn and sting. It's not to say that if you have sensitive skin, you can't use those, but I would say a less likely ingredient from the alpha hydroxy acid family to cause that kind of irritation is going to be mandelic acid. It's time to flip the cup. <laughs> I'm on a matcha tea kick. I don't know what it is. I've had matcha tea every day like the past month, two months, three months, it feels like. I've really been on a matcha kick. That peak tea matcha just dissolves really quickly in water. It's very convenient. And I'm drinking less coffee, although you guys know that's, that is uh, that is something I will never, ever, ever give up. Anyways, y'all, that concludes the Q&A. I hope you guys like this. And on the end slate, I will put my prior Q&A where I answered a bunch of questions. So check that out. I have all of these saved in a playlist. But if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend. And as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.